Good morning to all of you. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Anita Fion, and I am part of the Community Development and Engagement Team at RPAP. Our team members can be found across the province working with rural communities in the realm of attraction and retention of healthcare providers. I'm hosting today's workshop from Westlock, which is located in the Northeast Zone. I'll take a minute to thank my colleague, Holly, who, who will be helping me in the background for this session. I am privileged to acknowledge that Alberta is the homeland of many Indigenous peoples. It is the ancestral land of many First Nations peoples and within the boundaries of colonial Alberta. We live on the land of First Nations Treaty 6, Treaty 7, and Treaty 8 territories, as well as a small portion of the territory of Treaty 10 in the Northeast and Treaty 4 in the Southeast. We also recognize that this is the home of eight Métis settlements and the Métis Nations of Alberta. Before we get going with today's session, just a reminder of a few housekeeping details, I guess. As you've likely noticed, we have videos and sound off with participants just as an attempt to save on bandwidth. We know that there are some people out in the rural areas who struggle with internet connection, and we are hopeful that this will help. If you have questions, please be sure to put them in the chat box and we'll, we, we will do our best to watch for those and ensure that our presenter is able to answer them at the end of today's session. We're recording the session today and it should be available for you for your viewing once we have an opportunity to look at it and ensure the quality is suitable to share out. So in the work that we do in our communities, we have found that the interest that there is interest in learning more about health related organizations, organizations connected to rural Alberta. We thought that by hosting these organizations via Zoom, we could help get more information out to those of you who are interested. So to continue on, we are thrilled to have representatives here with us today from the Alberta Health Advocates. They will share a bit more about their organization who strive to empower Albertans to be effective advocates in their own health care. They provide support and advocacy for a health care system that is responsive and accountable to the people being served. Today, we will find out how we can connect with them and access their services. So now I'll turn it over to Robin McClung, who will be presenting the information, and to Jennifer, who will be supporting her with monitoring the chat box for comments and questions. So over to you, ladies. Thank you, Anita. Good morning, everyone. We are very happy to be here today, and thanks for attending. Uh, so you know, we're going to tell you about our office, and hopefully, uh, when you leave here today, you'll, you'll know how we might be useful to you in your work and uh, when to call us yourself or refer patients or clients to us. So we'll just, it, it's not a very long presentation. We're really hoping um, people will wanna um, have a conversation and ask us questions and, and we can discuss things. So you'll see a picture here of Catherine Douglas. She is the interim health advocate and mental health patient advocate. She's the permanent director in our office, um, but for the time being, she's also filling the advocate roles. So what we do, well, all of these spokes are aspects of what we do in our office. So I'm just gonna touch on them um, to give you some ideas of the kind of work we do. So just starting at the top there, <clears throat> well, actually in the middle, you can see that we are really two offices in one. So we are the health advocate, and we're also the mental health patient advocate. And all of, all of us who, who work directly with Albertans, which I do and Jennifer does, uh, I think there's now seven of us that do this same role, which is advocate representative. So we work directly with Albertans, um, patients, healthcare providers, policymakers, everyone and anyone. And, and we shift back and forth in these two roles all the time. Uh, so essentially the health advocate role works under the health act legislation and the mental health patient advocate is under the mental health act. Uh, but we've just kind of zippered them together in our office. So we do a lot of system navigation. And for us, that's a lot more than just um, giving phone numbers and referrals, although that's certainly part of the work we do. We really help explain the system, how it works. Um, we, we like to make sure people have as many options and ideas as possible after they, um, 
um, have contacted our office so that they have a better understanding of the lay of the land and how to find their way through the system to achieve their goals. One of the tools that we use in our work is the health charter. So we, we do work to promote the health charter. The health charter is written into the Health Act um, and it, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more in the presentation, but essentially it's, it's the ethical core of our health system and it sets out the expectations for both the users of the system and the healthcare providers in the system in what they can expect and, and to help guide their own um, behavior and actions. So we do talk to people about that health charter. We do a lot of coaching in our office. It's one of our primary ways of communicating. So in, like I was saying before, instead of just handing out a, a referral, we really walk people through it, not only what they might expect if we're referring just for example, say to um, AHS patient relations office, we'll tell them the purpose for that referral, but we also then go a little deeper and coach them on how to prepare to file a complaint, some of what they might expect in going through that process. We talk about communication strategies for improving their experience and um, hopefully leading to better outcomes for them too. Our goal really is to help build people up as much as possible so they're really effective advocates on their own in the system in any situation they find themselves in. Um, often that information is transferable to other sectors as well, not even just the health system. Um, so that coaching is a big piece of, of our work. And, and before we start coaching people, we do a lot of listening. We, we spend a lot of time just hearing what people are saying, hearing the details of their experiences and how it's affected them in their life, um, the history of how a situation evolved, what we learn is that by, by listening really carefully and patiently, we have a better understanding of the details of the issue that an Albertan is, is dealing with. And then they, they'll, we, we hear them say back to us that they, it helped them just feeling heard. So we try not to rush people um, or, or cause people to feel dismissed. We really try to be as present as possible and really allow them a, a chance to kind of air out their, their issues. We review and investigate complaints in both sides of our office, the health advocate and the mental health patient advocate. With the mental health patient advocate, those investigations are quite clearly defined in the Mental Health Act. So um, if there's a contravention of patient rights under the Mental Health Act, that can sometimes lead to um, our office investigating those situations. But the majority of the time, our investigations, uh, especially under the health advocate side, are a lot more informal. Sometimes they're as simple as a single conversation to get a better understanding of an issue by speaking with a healthcare provider or another relevant party. Um, we also will review complaints that don't have a home anywhere else. So when people call our office and they have a complaint, um, as sometimes this is just where the conversation starts is something felt negative to a person. So they reach out for some support. We, we have to, by law, the legislation says, if an office exists with a complaint process, we have to refer to them. So if it's an AHS complaint, we have to refer to patient relations. It's a complaint about a physician, we'll refer to CPSA, um, et cetera. Just, uh, there's many professional bodies, uh, so we do that. But there's some cracks in between. For example, uh, we, we have the authority to look into the private side of, of things in the health system. So often we're making calls uh, about a medical clinic or to just try to find out some information and look into things um, that wouldn't belong in another office like a patient relations office. So we, we, we fill the cracks in a lot of ways in the system to make sure that, that there is a home for everything. And a big part of what we do is to connect people to resources. 
So sometimes that's a concrete resource by giving a name and number of an office. Sometimes it's helping people understand the types of services they're looking for, or uh, to explain the system, how, you know, even things like the referral systems. Many people don't know that to be referred to a specialist, it needs to come from their family doctor, for example. So sometimes we're, we're connecting people to resources by just helping them understand how the system works. And, and then we provide education in big and small ways all the time. In our one-on-one -on -one, uh, work, we're educating people in the system and their options. We also do sessions such as this. Um, and uh, and we, like, we like to uh, talk about our office and, and ways to advocate in the health system at every opportunity. So in a nutshell, those are the functions of our office. So I said before that our office is in two parts, the health advocate and the mental health patient advocate. So we'll just go into a little bit more detail on each of those sides. So the health advocate functions under the Health Act and contains the health charter. So the health charter, I'm just gonna flip to the next slide quickly so you can see a quick graphic of it. It's hard to read on this, but it's an easily um, searched item in, in Google, just type in Alberta Health Charter and this will come up. But this, it's worth reading through if you're not familiar with it because it really does clearly set out these expectations for users in the system. And so we'll, we'll use that when we're talking with people about how that document can be a, a good support in having conversations and interacting with the health system. So to remind people that they're not a passive participant, that it's, it's also their responsibility to ask questions and make sure they're understanding um, a diagnosis or a treatment plan or how to communicate with a specialist office or whatever information they need. Um, the health charter can, can be a really good guide to, to help them find their path through that. Uh, so um, we also refer to the appropriate concern resolution mechanisms, as I discussed before, when an office exists to handle a concern, we have to um, refer them that way. So we do, we do a lot of that, guiding people to the right offices. The bulk of our work, though, falls under this next point, which is to navigate existing health-related issues. Often people find our office when they feel stuck. And that can take so many forms and it's very individual, but a person will keep trying something and feel like they're not gaining any progress. Um, just examples off the top of my head. Sometimes we'll hear from somebody who's very certain they have a certain condition or illness and they can't get their doctor to prescribe based on that or send them for a test that they know will lead to that diagnosis and they've tried for a long period of time and nothing's changing. And so we will talk to them about the role of the doctor and how to approach that conversation um, and, and help them find a way to disrupt that cycle of being stuck and find a more productive path through that. Um, so we also review complaints, although those are fairly rare because with all the various professional colleges, um, there's not a lot of complaints that don't have an office that's appropriate to um, process the complaint. Uh, but, but we do have the authority to look into things that don't have um, a home anywhere else. And then all of the data we collect and the stories we hear and, and what we learn in our office, we feed up um, formally to the Minister of Health, but also to to people in all kinds of higher up decision-making roles in the health system, um, in government, in AHS, we like to make sure that people in these roles know what's happening in, in reality with Albertans um, going using the health system. So we send a monthly report, but we also uh, have an annual report and um, and it just in sessions like this too, we're able to just share what we're learning and report the info. Um, when people call our office, they often assume or hope that with the word advocate in the title, it means we're going to be their advocate. 
And that's not really the kind of advocacy we do. The, our advocacy is more about hearing from the health system and users of the health system and advocating on behalf of Albertans to the government and the policymakers. So our advocacy is uh, the information we receive, we really feed it up to, to help improve the system. So some of the things we hear, and we, we could have filled out a hundred of these bubbles, we hear all kinds of things, but just to give you a sense of some of the reasons why people might contact our office, it is absolutely anything to do with the health system and often things that are slightly outside too. There's a lot of blurry boundaries around housing, for example, um, or even uh, say legal documents such as guardianship and trustee and decision, decision making um, documents. So, so we're often working at the edges of the health system as well. But these are the kinds of things that people may contact us about. Um, and so we hear them out. And, and one of the first questions we ask people is, what, are you, what is your goal? What, were, what are you hoping would happen when you contacted us? What would you like to see happen? Because for us in our office, that's how we keep the person in the center of person-centered care. And we know that things aren't always going to work out the way people want them to or hope they will. But whenever possible, we do try to keep that person's goals at the forefront of all the work we do with them. So depending on what their goal is and what the issue is they're presenting will then guide the work that we do and the conversations we have. Our overarching advocacy goals, um, as, particularly with the mental health patient advocate side of our office, but really in all of our work, is we want to make sure that legislated rights are protected. So again, those are quite clearly laid out in the Mental Health Act for mental health patients, but we use the health charter similarly. We, we want that document to be respected and upheld. And so we will review complaints that contravene the health charter. It's also important to us that patient needs are considered and met whenever possible. Um, just as I was saying before, we really like to know what a person's goals are and do what we can to keep those as our focus as well. We like to follow the, follow the patient. And we like to make sure that patients are supported to make informed decisions. And so that, that touches on to the coaching and education pieces too. Because often, even when we know their goal, instead of just giving them the options that would lead straight to that, we like people to know that they're choosing these things. So we will talk about all of the possibilities we're aware of or connect them to other resources for more information. So they really do have as much information as possible so they can um, make, make the best strategies in their situation. The mental health patient advocate, this office is, this part of the office has actually been around a long time. It uh, first came into being in 1990. Uh, it was established through the Mental Health Act. Uh, the health advocate is newer. It was, I think, 2014 um, is when it, we became a two-in-one office. So before that, the mental health patient advocate was a standalone office with a very clearly defined role. So uh, you can see these squares over the arrow here. Um, we were legislated under the Mental Health Act. We are authorized, our jurisdiction is to assist people who are under uh, a, like one admission certificate, also called a Form 1. Um, you may very well know, but all of the forms under the Mental Health Act are numbered, which makes them very confusing and hard to learn. But the Form 1 is an admission certificate. So to be held in the hospital to be detained against your will, so whether you wanna be there or not, to be held there requires two Form 1s. So two separate admission certificates issued by two separate qualified health professionals. But we are also authorized to assist people who are just under a single Form 1. So even if they're just partway through that process, sometimes that second form is never issued 
but people can call us in in that role um, with a single form one. And then um, of course we also assist formal patients, which is somebody under two form ones and people under a community treatment order or a CTO. So the role of the mental health patient advocate. So we, we, we exist primarily to protect and uphold patient rights. And I'll, I'll get into more specifically what those rights are in just a minute. We can investigate with or without a complaint. This is a little bit unique. So often we investigate when somebody reports an issue and often it's patients or their, their family or friends um, identifying an issue, contact us to discuss it and we'll look further into it. So often it is initiated because because somebody wants us to look into it. But sometimes we'll, we'll see a pattern or we'll identify something's just a little off or something's, something's kind of curious. So we'll follow that and look into it on our own. So we do have the authority to, to look into things um, without a specific complaint. We are in our office, all of us are custodians under the Health Information Act, which gives us a lot of, um, uh, a lot of room to make calls and gather information as we as we need to to uh, do these investigations. Uh, we do a lot of education about um, the Mental Health Act and patient rights. Um, again, we do that individually on the phone with people and families, or in larger sessions like this. We do a lot of um, like sessions specific to the Mental Health Act. Uh, for various groups in the province, such as the Schizophrenia Society and, and places like that. So we, we, um, we talk a lot about the details of the Mental Health Act. Um, advocacy. So again, we, what we hear from patients and their families, we, we raise to the advocate and decision makers and the health minister so that changes can be made. Um, when a person is detained in the hospital under the Mental Health Act, their rights and freedoms are heavily restricted. Uh, it, it's a very extreme situation. And so we take very seriously the limited rights that a patient does have in that situation, uh, which is why we, why we exist, I guess, is, is, is um, it's a very vulnerable group of people. I heard the statistic that about only about 5% of people um, diagnosed with a mental illness do end up, um, I'll say, interacting with the Mental Health Act. Uh, and so it's a very small number of people, but has an enormous impact on the people that it does affect. And so we make recommendations regarding care and treatment and rights. We don't make specific recommendations on patient treatment. We do not ever want or try to step on toes of medical professionals. It is not appropriate for us to have opinions on treatment decisions. Just uh, more quality of care issues are the kinds of things we would raise and, and to make sure that the details of the Mental Health Act are followed. Here's some of the key concepts in the Mental Health Act. These are are terms that, um, that come up all the time and have very specific definitions. You're probably familiar with a lot of these, so I, I don't think I'll go through them in too much detail. Just to draw your attention to a couple of things. One is, um, so the definition of mental disorder was actually, there were amendments to the Mental Health Act made in March of 2021. And so the definition of mental disorder which is a substantial disorder of thought, mood, perception, orientation, or memory that grossly impairs judgment, behavior, capacity to recognize reality, or the ability to meet the ordinary demands of life. So that's the definition of mental disorder, but it was amended to exclude um, brain injury. So it still includes neurodegenerative um, illness such as um, dementia, uh, but excludes brain injury. So that was a big change in the system. Also the term qualified health professional has replaced physician with those amendments. 
because there's now nurse, some nurse practitioners in Alberta authorized to um, issue form ones under the Mental Health Act and um, do some things like that. Uh, let's see, another one is designated and non-designated facility. So in Alberta, there's 22 designated facilities. So a person can only be detained under the Mental Health Act at a designated facility. So I believe there's 14 um, in Edmonton and Calgary, and the remaining eight are in the rural or smaller urban centers in Alberta. So they're few and far between. So often in rural areas, that first form one will be issued in the community or at the local hospital. But at that point, um, it becomes imperative because the Mental Health Act says so, that that person is conveyed to a designated facility uh, as soon as possible. Um, I think these other terms are probably, the community treatment order is, is um, it's a way to expand services for a person uh, when they're not in a designated facility, but for a person who has a history of decompensating without a little extra support or oversight. So for the, the most common scenario for that is if someone is say not doing well in the community and they're detained in the hospital and stabilized with treatment and medical supports, if they then are discharged from the hospital and stop taking, stop following the treatment plan and decompensate, end up back in the hospital, when this happens a few times, say three or four times in a relatively short period of time, like a couple of years, that can be one of the, the kind of flags that initiates a, a community treatment order. And it's a way to maintain um, treatment in the community. Um, the review panel is a quasi-judicial panel made up of three people. So it's chaired by a lawyer. There's also a psychiatrist on that panel and a member of the public. And that's the appeal process for somebody detained under the Mental Health Act. Often when people are, are held in the hospital, they don't wanna be there and they do not agree with the decision to hold them there. And so they have a legal right to apply for a hearing with the review panel who will take an objective look at their case and see if you know, they, they, there's enough evidence from the doctor to, to uphold that decision. Uh, so the review panel does have the authority to overturn that. And in some cases they do. So these right here are the rights of a patient under the Mental Health Act. Often um, calls to our office from, from people who are detained under the Mental Health Act begin with a statement like my rights are are being violated um, because it feels, it, it certainly feels that way to people. And when you look at other sets of rights, like under the Charter of Human Rights, for example, there's not many situations where people can be held against their will, but the Mental Health Act can, can override many of those things. So we have often have conversations to explain to people that they don't actually have a right to have their cell phone or to have a coffee when they want, or even to have a visitor when they want, that the staff are able to determine what are deemed privileges and when those will happen, that their rights are as basic as these things. So they have a right to copies of, of paperwork that's issued under in their name. So copies of their form ones or form twos or treatment orders and things like that. They also have a right to consent or refuse treatment. Um, we have lots of conversations too to explain where that might go if they just say no to treatment. There, you know, needs to be a little more conversation there, but they have a right to, to say no unless that right is taken away in other ways. They have a right to appeal to the review panel. So to appeal the doctor's decision to keep them there, a qualified health professional. If they're dissatisfied with the decision the review panel makes, then they have a right to appeal to the Court of King's Bench. I see we need to edit our slide now where we have a Court of King's Bench instead of Court of Queen's Bench. 
that's a much more formal legal process. We advise people to get legal counsel for that process. Um, they have a right to send and receive written communications. Uh, so they can send a letter, receive a letter. It's still a little bit murky about handling things like texts and emails. So there's still some figuring out in that area, but they do have a right to communicate with others outside the facility. They have a right to visitors, uh, maybe not always at the times that they want, but certainly have a right to receive visitors. They have a right to privacy of, of their health information. They do have a right to access a lawyer. So um, all patients are legally entitled to representation for free from legal aid, uh, duty counsel for review panels. Sometimes people will choose to waive that right or retain their own lawyer. Um, they don't have the same right for the Court of King's bench, uh, but sometimes if the lawyer from legal aid thinks it's a good case, they will represent the patient at that level. They have a right to access our office. So they have a, a right to, to contact us. In fact, when people are detained in hospital, um, they're asked at that point if they would like our office to give them a call. Um, and they have a right to access uh, their relevant medical records for the review panel. And every facility has a slightly different process for that, but overall, Patients have a right to receive um, copies of their health chart in order to prepare for that review panel. And that in a nutshell, in a really brief kind of overview is what we do in our office. So when people call us, we don't, it, it doesn't really matter if it's under the health advocate side or under the mental health patient advocate side, because in any single conversation, we likely go back and forth. Um, so, it, it, but, but just so you have an understanding of how the two parts came to be and how they work together now. Uh, so it's not just users of the health system that contact us. We regularly have conversations with physicians, psychiatrists, lawyers, um, social workers, anyone and everyone who, who might have a question about a nuance of a policy or the Health Act or Mental Health Act. And we are always happy to have those conversations. And even if we don't have the answers, we're always happy to listen and we do what we can to get people um, connected to those who really can help more. So we invite all of you to, to not hesitate to contact us or to refer others to our office. So yeah, like I say, that's, that's basically what we do. And I'm hoping you know, maybe we can have some conversation now if anyone has um, questions or a scenario uh, to discuss. We've, we've got lots of time to do that. I can just just to fill in time while people are formulating their questions or thoughts. Um, a couple of things that that I know are, we've heard um, that that are relevant to rural areas in the last couple of weeks even. So we hear, we know that it's really hard to find a family doctor outside of Edmonton and Calgary. Well, even in Edmonton and Calgary now, but we know that's a really critical issue right now. We also have heard from some rural facilities that, that there's a lot of difficulty and challenges when a person is held there, when a single form one has been issued to figure out how to keep them there securely if security isn't available, how to deal with rapid to get the conveyance piece to happen. We know there's sometimes some pushback or misunderstanding from rapid in how to make that happen. So we do hear some of those too, but we, we'd be happy to hear about other issues too. Myrna, I, I see you on the screen there. Go ahead and ask a question. Um, yes, I just heard yesterday that our local area is losing their mental health person. So is there a website where we can go on to see if there's a new one put into place, when it'll happen, or how do we access that information? So when you say losing their mental health person, is it an AHS, like mental health and addiction program or a private practitioner? Great question. I'm not 100% sure, but it's from our local Flair area that this lady works out of. Yeah, one thing I would do, it would be to, to 
steer the person or to give a call to the mental health helpline because they they tend to keep really up to date information and connect people in that call. It might not be a one stop shop. It might also take a little digging with AHS, but that's also something we'd be happy to help with. So if you wanted to get a little support in figuring that out, we'd be really happy to help do some of the digging behind the scenes to find out what's going on and see if there's a plan. Um, so I'd invite you to connect with us outside of this presentation and we'll, we'll get a lot more into that. Excellent, thank you. We have a couple of questions here that came in the chat. I'll just kind of go through these one by one if, if you'd like Robin and then you can add to it. Um, one here, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, one question is, what do you advise to people who do not have a doctor? Um, again, Robin mentioned that is something that we definitely hear about, um, people having difficulties finding a new doctor, doctors that are accepting new patients, um, particularly in rural areas, and sometimes travel is an issue as well. Uh, one of the main things that we'll do is direct them to the appropriate places to potentially find doctors that are accepting new patients. So that would be through 811, uh, a PCN, or even CPSA. Um, there was another new one we came across, Robin, online. I can't remember which that one was off the top of my head, but there's a few different resources there to find new doctors. Um, it, it definitely is difficult. It is something that we do keep track of. Um, sometimes I'll suggest to people trying to find a doctor that might accommodate telephone or Zoom appointments, particularly if, if travel is an issue, but um, that's sort of how we would support that type of, of an inquiry from people. I don't know, Robin, if you have anything yeah, to add. No, to the me. only other thing I sometimes say is, you know, I'm, like sometimes the websites aren't always up to date, or if a physician has a single space for a new patient that might not be posted. So I always think it's worth a chance if there is a physician's office in the area, because there isn't always, but if there is one, it's worth going in there and checking. They might say no, but maybe there's a way to be on a wait list or work it out differently too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's certainly not always, uh, not always a solution or an answer to that. And then we've got another one here. Um, I've heard a lot of negative feedback with regards to wait times on the phone to access. Is there any chance that this service will be improved? Um, I personally haven't heard that. Um, I'm sure that could definitely be an issue. That's an AHS program. Um, so any complaints or concerns could go through patient relations. However, if we're getting calls like that, if we get a number of calls related to that same issue, then we can bring it forward to the advocate to, to also bring forward to patient relations because we do have a good um, relationship with, with that department and uh, they meet quite frequently. So any concerns could come to us, but ultimately that's an EHS program. Um, so concerns could go to patient relations. Again, Robin, anything to add there? No, I think, and that's true. There's, there's really only so far we can dig into AHS. It's it, like we, yeah, it's hard for us to really step into those kind of things. But I would say it's, it, we have heard of like a long hold time or just not being able to get through to the program. Um, I, I would maybe say to somebody, you know, once you do get through and you're through that intake point and you're connected with someone, hopefully it gets easier at that point, or at least you have the opportunity to ask, is there another way to connect? Can I have a direct line? Is there any way around this single point of entry, mm -hmm. you know, to see if the program itself has any suggestions for, for how to actually connect with them? Um, maybe email requests can be sent, uh, you know, it just depends on the situation and, and how they're connected to the program. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's an issue. Yeah. And again, I think to our office is more focused on those systemic issues rather than the individual advocacy, even though we try to help people as much as possible along the way. Um, so those systemic issues too are important to us as well. Um, so we've also got here, this one's a little trickier to answer, um, what to do with a non-emergency situation but need to see a doctor when an appointment is unavailable. Um, that one, I think there's been a couple of different ways I've helped um, callers with regard to those issues. 
maybe trying to explore what the limitation is. Um, why is there a lack of appointments? Um, sometimes the patients have difficulties even getting through to the clinics in the first place to make an appointment. There have been times when I've reached out as well to the clinic just to see what some of those options might be. Ultimately, it's the doctors that set the appointments, so we're not really able to advocate to get a patient in to, to see the doctor and get that appointment booked, but we might be able to try to help them find ways to resolve that concern, maybe dig a little bit deeper to find out what's going on. Um, yeah, or even an alternative, like um, yeah. a virtual appointment or a, a nurse practitioner. It, it really would depend on the area and what's actually available, but mm -hmm. there, there might be something adjacent to seeing the doctor that could still suffice, acknowledging mm -hmm. that there sometimes just isn't really a good answer. It's, it's a bunch of band-aids. Yeah, and I think it's just doing a little bit of that digging to find out what the, the root of the issue is and just trying to help them find a way to resolve that concern. So. Yeah, there could be a number of different factors at play when it comes to something like that. I hope I'm answering all of these or answering these questions enough for people. So please uh, let us know if you need more information. Um, sorry, I'm just reading through these. Yeah, I just put the number for the mental health helpline on there. It's a really good one. They've, they've just overhauled it recently. And I have heard that from a couple of clients that they had really good experiences calling there. So that line is staffed by nurses and social workers, um, psychologists. Like it's, it's staffed with real professionals that, that know the, the sector. And they, uh, you know, hear, hear what the person's looking for and have a conversation. And the goal is to get them connected to supports in that call. So they've, they really put a lot into that and they're really trying to beef it up. many do we handle on average in a year? I think it's around 2,500. And yeah, it's, I don't know that number offhand. Yeah, the, and the numbers are, it's hard to even know what those numbers mean because sometimes a, a case is open and closed in a single conversation. It can take five or 10 minutes and it's done. Um, other ones can go on for months and months and months as a situation evolves or if it's really complex. But yeah, we, we open and close about 2,500 cases a year. I think about two thirds of those we would consider health advocate cases and the other third would be mental health patient yeah. cases. Yeah, we could get one call that takes a lot of time and another call that is just maybe a simple referral. So it really um, depends on the types of calls that we're getting as well when you're looking at, at time spent too. So. There was one more in the chat here. How are youth handled? Um, I guess it would depend on the nature of the call from the, from the youth and how old they are. Um, I don't know, Robin. I don't, I don't usually get a lot of calls from young people. I think some calls that we might get from youth would be um, perhaps teenagers that are being detained in a, a designated facility. Um, yeah, I, I like I we wouldn't deal with the, the youth any differently than we would anybody else. But of course, finding out what they're calling about, the reason for their call. Um, do we have a guardian that we need to maybe be connecting with as well? Or, you know, their parent, depending on the nature of the call, we would help if it's within our, our legislation. Um, there's also the child and youth advocate. You know, we may refer to other offices that might be more more appropriate. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Robin, I'm, I don't really yeah, have a clear we, we answer certainly, on that. We do get, we get a lot of calls from like, concerned family members. So, and I, I divide those into two. So there's the parents of minors. So parents dealing with, with mental health issues with their kids who are under 18. And then the parents who are dealing with adult children with mental illness. And often in both of those conversations, so there's the, the focus on the, the family member who's struggling, but a lot of the conversation comes back to, we, we've, we're talking about like, what is your support? How are you coping? Do you have connection to 
uh, say, like if it's um, a parent with an adult child with mental illness, we'll often direct them to a support like CMHA or FAMI or some of the groups that exist so that parents can not only be with people dealing with similar issues, but we always say too that you're going to learn the best tips and tricks from other people who are just a step or two ahead of you on that journey. So, and, and the isolation and, and difficulty of trying to keep someone going when you ultimately don't have a lot of direct control over it. And I would say that's true, even with a youth, parents need support in order to keep being able to support that family member. So the system really needs to wrap around the whole family and I know in, if it gets to a point where a youth is detained um, in a facility, there, there's some really good AHS stuff happening at that level too, where they've now got some outreach supports for the parents of the detained youth. And they leave the facility, go meet the parents when they're at, whether it's a coffee break or after work, or really try to, to, to meet the parents in the way that works for them to provide some support from the system for, for what the whole family is dealing with too. Yeah. Thanks, Robin. That was a better answer than I gave initially. <laughs> no, <it's... laughs> um, there's one here too that I had missed. My family has recently experienced significant reductions in health service coverage within the AISH program. Can you help us make a plea for reconsideration for specific services that have been denied? Um, when it comes to other programs, so say if it's something um, being denied through the AISH program, we're not able to advocate for these specific services. We may help people in general terms understand the process a little bit more. Uh, the AISH program and the financial benefits programs are two different, a different ministry. So we don't really have any jurisdiction over those programs, um, but we might make some suggestions what's being denied do you know why it's being denied? Are there other maybe health services that might be helpful um, in the meantime, researching other options? Uh, within the AGE program, there's the appeal process and stuff like that. Um, there's also the uh, Disability Advocates Office, and I do know that they deal more specifically with AGE clients, and they, I think they might work a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with the clients and those programs. So if we would get a call from a client with a concern about that program, we would gather some of the information just to see if there's any um, aspects that we can assist with. And then we may even suggest that they connect with the Disability Advocates Office or, um, or refer them to that office, or we can sometimes connect with them and say this is the situation. They're not custodians under the Health Information Act, so we're not able to share any information that we have with them without the client's permission. So that's a little trickier. Um, so again, we're not able to advocate for specific services, again, helping them maybe understand some of the programs, some of the options, um, connecting them with other more appropriate supports that maybe can do, can do that. I'm putting the contact info up for oh, that perfect. office. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We talk with them quite frequently back and forth, even just in general terms to, you know, gather information, see what they can help with to they're located in the same building as us, just up on a couple floors up. But yeah, they are. Re they know. They have learned so many um, nuances in dealing with H. You'd probably find them to be a really good resource. They're they're a helpful, hardworking office. Yeah. Yeah, and I think too, like if we were to connect with an H worker for some reason. We likely wouldn't be able to share any information, whereas I think that they have a little bit more, more freedom there being with, I believe they're still with the same government ministry, but of course dealing with that program. I think that's one of the, um, the highest types of calls that they get are, I know H numbers are quite high on their, on their list of contacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is, I mean, this right here is a lot how it looks like when we're working because some, so issues will come to us because everything is connected to health. I mean, how, how is age not a health issue? And yet there it is in a different ministry with it. Like it's, it's so confusing and fragmented. Mm -hmm. So often we will, we'll have like a really in-depth conversation to understand all the different aspects and 
you know, the services you used to have and what's missing now and how's that affecting you and what's happened in between and then say, okay, now give a call over to the persons with disabilities advocate office, see what they can do and then come back with what you learn or what's still missing. And so people will kind of come out and come back. Often we're serving as a home base, helping just to kind of be that backup and make sure they've got someone to bounce ideas off of or to rehearse a conversation or wh whatever that is. This is really what it looks like when we're, when we're working. And as you've seen, we don't always have the answers, um, but we, we go out and do a lot of research and digging to find them when we need to, too. And I think that's important what you just said too, Robin, you know, as far as even referring people to other agencies or departments, we try to prepare them as much as possible for where we're sending them and why, but we always encourage them to call us back if that doesn't work out or, you know, if you face any barriers with that, you know, give us a call back and we can sometimes help open up those lines of communication. If that was not the right place, you know, you know, try to connect them with the right place. So so we really try to be sure that we're sending people to the right place the first time um, and encouraging them to call back if they need any more help or assistance. So, yeah, so sometimes those calls, you know, can go back back and forth quite a bit as we're trying to help people. So, so yeah, it's not just a simple referral and then off you go. It's, you know, still being here for them if they need us. Yeah, well, trying as hard as possible for people not to feel bounced around because yeah. this happens all the time, right? Yeah. You call somebody and they say, we don't do that, call these guys. And they may or may not do it. And people go on these goose chases. Mm -hmm. I think I have um, addressed all of the questions in the chat box. If I've missed anything, please let me know. Yeah, and if you think of anything later, please do feel free to reach out to our office, phone us, email us. We'd be, we'd be happy to hear from you. Excellent. Thank you so much to Robin and Jennifer for this wonderful session on helping Albertans become better advocates in their health care. I really especially enjoyed hearing you share about advocating for wraparound services for families. Um, as we know, none of us live in a bubble, even though we might want to sometimes. Um, the more informed we are as citizens about services available to us, the better equipped we are to help ourselves and others out there.